it's Fantasy Authors Handbook on YouTube. That means I must be Phil. Let's just dive right into this because today we're doing, oh, we're getting into stuff. We're getting into some stuff. We're talking about adverbs. Oh, adverbs. Oh, no. Everyone tells you adverbs are bad. Bad, bad, terrible words. Terrible words that will destroy every manuscript, will destroy your career, will destroy everything. They are, ooh, Stephen King in this book on writing, which by the way, I have read twice and love. Um, I believe the road to hell is paved with adverbs and I will shout it from the rooftops. He did more than shout it from the rooftops. He wrote it in here, which uh, got to a lot more people. Was he wrong? Let's talk about that. I even found a website that said you can only use one adverb per 300 words. It's like as a rule, um, which is just bizarre. That's not even a little bit of a thing, right? I think this came from actually one of those goofy like writing apps that count the number of adverbs in your manuscript and, and try to make you feel bad about yourself in some sort of strange new technological way. It's really definitely sounds like something that a software engineer wrote in there based on a complete lack of understanding of creative writing. I went there. Anyway. But quickly, what even is an adverb, right? Tell me you've seen the Schoolhouse Rock episode, even if you're not necessarily a gentleman of a certain age. Um, it, it's, it's really pretty basic, right? It's a descriptive word that ends generally, but not always, with the letters L and Y, right? Angrily, happily, calmly, etc. You get it. I've seen people talking about adverb hate online for years now, as though, like, what, one adverb anywhere in a full-length manuscript is just going to destroy the thing, or it's a sign of an amateur writer, that no agent will ever represent a book with an adverb in it, readers will make fun of you on TikTok and Goodreads, and all hellfire and damnation upon the evil adverb. I'm here to blow that nonsense to smithereens today. Let's just blow that up once and for all. Yeah. I don't know. Should I should I right now be channeling my inner K A Ammons and close my eyes and let's take a deep cleansing breath. <sighs> <sighs> then let's say it together. Adverbs are fine. Why say that to ourselves? Why? Because it's true. Adverbs are a perfectly acceptable, even necessary part of speech. And just blindly de deleting them from your manuscript because an app told you to, especially because of that nonsense, is the sign of an amateur, if that's what you're worried about. Learning how to use them properly is a sign of a writer. And here's the good news, ready? Super good news. Learn how to use them properly is not so hard. We're going to cover that here. It's not going to take that long. And I'm going to use examples. Examples from where, you ask? I'm not just going to make them up. Usually I do write the Galen and Bronwyn examples, but this time I'm going to use this fantastic classic of science fiction literature. This is Perry Rodan number 19, Mutants versus Mutants by Clark Darleton, translated by Wendy and Ackerman, Ace Books, 1972. Fun book, right? All of these Perry Rodan books are just a hoot. Okay, not necessarily like the most well-crafted, also 52 years old, just a youngster, right? Um, maybe we're all more adverb aware now than they were back then. I don't know. Anyway, it didn't take me long to just kind of flip through this and just sort of spot. Oh, there's one. Oh, there's one. Oh, hmm, that's interesting. So I pulled examples out of here shockingly quickly. Anyway, it, it is super easy to learn how to use adverbs properly. Again, once we calm down and realize that they're not just automatically the enemy, that's nonsense. But anyway, let's identify what the fuss is really about. Because I don't think Stephen King was just crazy. He wasn't nuts when he said adverbs are an issue. And he, in fact, gets into it a little bit more deeply in the book, too, which we'll touch back on. Let's start with, I don't know, let's, let's look at this adverb right here from mutants 
versus mutants. Rodan smiled gently. Overhead, my dear Mercant, exactly 18 miles above us. Are you surprised? The adverb, which is gently, is, believe it or not, perfectly fine. It's describing a smile in a way that's clear and even vivid, I think, and human. I get it, right? Also, since Rodan is the POV character, point of view character, he knows what he means by the smile he's smiling. He means to be gentle. He smiled gently on purpose. Keep that in mind. Yeah. Really, POV is everything. Everything. In the meantime, I'm working past the fact that the author, or at least the editor, should have spelled out the word 18 there. <laughs> That's a gripe for another day. Another breath. And then there's this. Pucky shook his little head regretfully, it seemed, and grinned. This is also perfectly fine. Shocking, right? A reasonable observation from the POV character. And first of all, we all have to immediately name at least one character in our, in our work in progress, Pucky. That, unlike the one in 300 adverbs, is now a rule. Anyway, Pucky actually did something in this sentence. He shook his little head, didn't he? There's a verb there, right? Shook. Then it's up to the POV character to get the feeling, to draw the conclusion that Pucky was regretful. The skillful addition of it seemed after that makes it, it, that even more clear. We understand that Pucky only seems regretful and as far as the POV character is concerned, right? So is he really regretful? I don't know. But is this, an, is this an unreliable narrator? All narrators are kind of unreliable. They should be because these are you're, they're supposed to be humans. Yeah, Perry Rodan is a human. He's super awesome and cool, you know, but he's still human. Sometimes, though, this conclusion is less clear, right? As in this one. Rodan leaned forward and looked inquiringly into Mercant's eyes. Do you know a Clifford Monturney? This begs the question, is inquiringly necessary when a question, an inquiry, immediately follows? Doesn't this work just as well without it? Rodan leaned forward and looked into Mercant's eyes. Do you know a Cliff Monturney? I, don't, I think it's fine without the adverb. So in this case, it's not just, oh, the adverb is a terrible, terrible thing and you should never have any word in your manuscript ever that ends with L-Y. It just feels unnecessary. Now you're actually telling us something. He was inquiringly speaking this and then showing us the inquiry. Do you know a Clifford Monturney? Okay, now here's where we get to the, yeah, let's talk about this adverb right here part of the video, yeah? Most of the time, well, actually almost all the time, look, I may even, I might even be comfortable saying all of the time I call out adverbs to authors I work with is when they show up as part of dialogue attribution. You know, dialogue attribution, right? That's the bit where you tell your readers who's saying what. Phil said, Superman replied, so on. That kind of thing, yeah. And you know, when I talk, Superman listens. Stephen King said so too, right? Back in On Writing. He said, I can be a good sport about adverbs, though. Yes, I can. With one exception, dialogue attribution. I insist that you use the adverb and dialogue attribution only in the rarest and most special of occasions, and not even then, if you can avoid it. Okay, so you probably guessed it. Here's an example of an adverb in dialogue attribution from our new favorite sci-fi novel of all time, Mutants vs. Mutants. What do you want? I believe, shouted Mercant excitedly. There's all sorts of awful in here, and it's not just the adverb. Let's break it down. Here we know that Mercant shouted this, it says so. But I have to ask, can you end a shout in ellipses? Ellipses indicate that a character has intentionally trailed off. That didn't really work because intentionally trailed off is a full sentence, but you get it, right? Maybe it indicates that 
some sound or some commotion or something prevented the POV character from hearing the rest of that, that sentence? Uh, I don't know, right? Because remember, it is all about the POV character's experience of what and how Mercant shouted this line of dialogue. So the ellipses means something, but this is a tough one, right? So if this is true, that it, he wasn't just somehow shouting and drifting off at the same time, which I can't see, but something interrupted him, right? Do we rewrite it like this? What do you want? I believe, shouted Mercan excitedly as the roar of the rocket ship engines drowned out all other sounds. Still, though, what exactly does the author mean by excitedly? This is the adverb. This is the problem. I know I've pulled, I've pulled this out of context, right? I, we're not reading the whole rest of the page, let alone the whole rest of the short novel, really, novella. So maybe seeing the whole page would help, but even then, is he excited in a happy way? He said this excitedly, so he's excited in an upset way, a frightened way. What does excitedly look like? And that's the comment authors I work with see sometimes over and over again, yeah, in edits from me. Instead of reporting on the fact that Mercant is excited, show us Mercant being excited and in a way that somehow moves the scene forward. What could Mercant be doing to signal excited? How about this? What do you want? I believe, shouted Mercant, waving his arms over his head and jumping up and down as the roar of the rocket ship engines drowned out all other sounds. Okay, it's kind of goofy still, right? It's kind of clunky. It's still, I think, in keeping with the Perry Rodan spirit. But there's a tad more finesse there, no? Or you could come up with a little something a little bit better than that. But see what I mean there, right? Now we're showing Mercant doing something that signals excitedly. Something that can be read, interpreted, understood as excited. And then we're and then also with the additional sort of added bonus of helping us understand how you uh, shout with ellipses. Look at this line too. The mutant master is a hypno, said Tatiana emphatically. Notice that I didn't read that emphatically because I didn't know that she was saying that emphatically until I got to the end of the sentence. Then I was told, oh wait, go back and see here, experience that as emphatically. This has the same basic issue, right? This is, how many times have you heard this advice? How many times have you heard this advice from me? Read this in my blog, in books that I've written. It's everywhere. All of us say this. Everyone who's an editor, everyone who teaches writing, everyone who has been taught writing and then shares that information wherever it is. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. Show, don't tell. Over and over and over again. Unlike the weird rule about adverbs are the worst thing in the world, show, don't tell is actually important. Right? So what this, this quote here has, the mutant master is a hypno, said Tatiana emphatically, is that it tells us she's doing something or saying something emphatically. Instead, what we want to do is show her being emphatic. Right? So, as is, I'm not even sure which part of the short sentence he's most emphatic about. You know, emphatic can be shown actually pretty easily, rather than told. Just by manipulating the punctuation in and around the line of dialogue itself, and with the careful application of italics, right? What are italics for? They signal emphasis. You already have a tool that says she's emphasizing this word, this string of words, this sentence, part of a sentence, etc. How about this edit here? The mutant master, the mutant master is a hypno, said Tatiana. Right? Now we know who's saying it, and in context we probably already know that, but it, yeah, it helps. But I added the ellipses to trail off at first, showing that Tatiana is trying to make sure that the subject of her emphatic accusation is the mutant master, right? The mutant master. Pay attention to that. 
is a hypno. Hypno in italics, so she emphasized that word, that key word, the accusation itself. The mutant master is a hypno. And you get that emphasis with the italics before the dialogue attribution. So you don't read the full sentence just kind of like, the mutant master is a hypno. And then, oh, wait, she was being emphatic there. Now I'm, I have been told, uh-oh. If you really wanted to change said Tatiana to Tatiana accused, go ahead. That might feel a little bit much to me, but it would certainly fit in the Perry Rodan book anyway. All right, so I think it's really just one more example, right? Another confusing example. And this is why adverbs aren't just, it isn't just about show versus tell, but that's mostly what it is. Showing someone being excited rather than telling us that that person is excited. Sometimes they just get a little bit confusing. The word just doesn't trigger what it's supposed to trigger. In this example, again, from mutants versus mutants. Hold on, begged the mutant master maliciously. Okay, alliteration for starters. Yeah, three M words in a row will at the very least trigger your audiobook narrator. But more importantly, what does maliciously look like, sound like, or otherwise feel like to the POV character who's listening to this? By using that particular adverb, the author is making an assumption that we, and when I say we in this case, I mean your readers, understand what maliciously begging looks like. Can I be honest? I have no idea. I can, uh, I can conjure up an image of someone begging, yeah, but how do you beg with malice? I don't know about you, but that's just not already in my head. It's not there. You can't call that up. Like I was able to call up, he smiled gently. I could see that. That felt human to me. I don't know what this looks like. So in terms of show, don't tell, this is not only tells how the mutant master is begging, but it fails even at that because I don't know how these things come together. How do you beg maliciously? And look, that's the whole thing about this adverbs and dialogue attribution problem. For the most part, and you know, listen, I'm afraid there's no always here. There is no always here in the same way that there isn't a rule for the number of adverbs per 300 words that you can <laughs> use, which is completely insane. An adverb, generally speaking, or in, in dialogue attribution, and this is what Stephen King is talking about, right? It tells how someone is saying something, right? And that show versus tell advice lives, honestly, primarily right in this moment for the overwhelming majority of authors. The overwhelming majority of popular genre fiction manuscripts. We don't read fiction to be told a story. I know that may sound weird to people, but bear with me. We don't read fiction to be told a story. We read fiction to experience a story. And we experience the story by becoming the POV character. The farther you as an author, we as authors, push those two people apart, the reader and the character, the greater the emotional distance between those two entities who are vitally important to you. The farther you push them away, the less engaged your reader becomes. Because now we're looking, we're being told about this guy over here, this person over here doing a thing. And that's, I guess that's kind of interesting depending on what he's doing. But we don't want to know what somebody is doing. We don't want to be told what somebody is doing. We want to be that person. You want to bring those two together, reader, character, right? That's how you immerse your reader in your book by immersing your reader in your point of view character's experience. And this is important, right? You don't actually, you can't really get them all the way together here, right? You can't smush a reader into your book. But you can get them as close as humanly possible, right? You get them as close as you can with words. And then let your reader take over from there. And if they have, your reader, we, have the proper clues that you've left us, we can get the, the rest of the way there ourselves. Because reading in itself is a creative act, right? Give your readers that 
their due in that respect, right? Give them that access to your story that they get to have for themselves to close the rest of that distance and say, I get it. I am that person. I understand what's happening here. I can feel that, right? Give your, your readers the benefit of the doubt. Right? We can understand body language. We understand word choice. We can understand clues like ellipses ending a sentence or an exclamation mark or something like that. We understand emphasis, like we just talked about, we showed with italics, just says, mm, I'm, I'm emphasizing that word. We can tell what a character is thinking, right? Draw that conclusion ourselves as readers. And that's part of the, the shared experience that reading fiction actually is or really, 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 really should be. So will some readers interpret those clues differently from what you expected? Sure, right? What you're hoping for is that readers won't be as flummoxed as I was about how you beg maliciously. So this is where you come in in terms of crafting this experience as best you can. But if you've thought through, right, what maliciously or what gently or what emphatically looks and sounds like most of the time, they will be right with you, your readers. We will be right with you. Adverbs are words. They're words. They're not banned words. There are no banned words. As authors, we get to use all of the words. Even if you live in Texas, you get to use all the words. We even get to make some up from time to time, especially writing fantasy science fiction. Yeah, And there's absolutely nothing special about adverbs. There's nothing especially great about adverbs. There's nothing especially bad about adverbs. There's no reason to count adverbs. Oh my God, use them just like you use adjectives, nouns, verbs, right? With care and thought and in service to your characters and the story they are sharing with your readers. Good. All right, listen, thanks everybody. Do, you know, you got to do what you do because this is YouTube, subscribe, comment and all that stuff. And I will see you very soon, as soon as I can with more Fantasy Authors Handbook on YouTube and on the blog every Tuesday. Take care, everybody.